Thank you everybody for coming to this, the NKR number seven panel on hurdles to uh, North Korean diplomacy. Center, we, uh, have we have three presentations for you over the next, what is this, about an hour and a half now, um, ranging you know, in, in their approaches and their topics from looking at North Korean defectors to abductees, uh, to kind of broader questions of South Korean foreign policy, but I guess united in this panel uh, through their through their interest in, uh, as I said, these kind of hurdles to to diplomacy on the peninsula. Uh, uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Luwalia, and I'm from Delhi, India. I'm currently doing my master's in East Asian Studies from University of Delhi. And today I will be sharing my presentation on the topic, Inter-Korean Relations and the Elusive Situation of North Korean Defectors in South Korea. So the reason why I chose this topic is because uh, I wanted to focus more on social issues, such as the uh, situation of North Korean defectors, rather than focus on political and military issues so that we can provide a more humanitarian lens to Korean unification studies. And the paper is divided into four parts, and I will briefly touch upon each part. The first part of the presentation is related to the reason and motivation behind why North Korean defectors take the decision to defect from their country. So foremost, the reason is due to nutritional reasons and poverty. The first wave of defectors that came to South Korea was in 1994, when North Korea experienced a massive famine. And even now in 2022, the situation remains the same. And one can see this with beggar children called Kot Chebi on the streets of North Korea who beg for food. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that word wrong. And food shortages due to border closure during the pandemic also made lack of food the highest level of response for North Korean citizens to flee. The second most reason for escape is to end the emotional dictatorship to the philosophy of Juche. Now, Juche was created by Kim Il-sung, and it can be described as a doctrine which is used to induce severe nationalism and faith in the worship of Kim dictators. Any threat to this ideology is eliminated and strictly monitored, and one can see this through the ban on the internet and media control in North Korea. Therefore, to escape this enslavement of mind, people defect to find individuality and a mind capable of thinking on its own, away from the political propaganda. And the third most reason for defection is to escape a society with sharp inequalities and virtually no economic opportunities. Uh, this is because North Korea follows a caste system which is referred to as Songbun. Under Songbun, people are divided into groups depending on their loyalty uh, to the leader and their close ties to the party. Uh, because of this stratification, there is basically no upward mobility of the citizens and they cannot increase or improve their economic status in the society uh, because they are limited to this hereditary class system until their death. In exploring these factors, you can see the graph that there are many more reasons and by no means the reasons that I have put are exhaustive. And, but in exploring some of the complex financial, political and cultural forces at play, I wanted to lay a background reality of what makes North Korean people defect. I'll move on to the second part of my presentation. Uh, the second part of the paper outlines the journey of the defectors. Now you can see through this map that the geography of North Korea is internationally isolated with its physical boundary surrounded by water. Its shared boundary with South Korea is impenetrable because of the abundance of military personnel and also because the land and sea is mined. And now the trajectory of most defectors come from the north of the state, uh, which is adjoined by China. Now it has two rivers. It has the banks of Tunmin River and Yalu River, and it is also adjoined by the Changbai mountain range. You can see the Changbai volcano there. So most defections occur through the Tunmin River where the depth is less and the width is narrower. And defections are also successful due to the help received from border cities like Tangton, Lainong, and Jilin, where the Korean Chinese population live. So after crossing the border, some North Koreans prefer to stay in China where they can earn money and some go to Mongolia and then they can depart from, uh, depart from Mongolia to South Korea or other global regions because there is no direct way to defect from North Korea to South Korea. 
I'll move on to my next slide. Uh, according to the Ministry of Unification in South Korea, North Korean refugees living in the South account for about 33,856 people compared to nearly 52 million South Koreans. It is likely that North Korean defectors are residing in secret in South Korea. However, fear inhibits them to come forward. Therefore, the data is under, uh, therefore, the data might not be correct and true. The largest proportion of refugees happen to be in their 20s and 30s, followed by those in their 40s. Currently, uh, most North Koreans crossing into China are women. Apart from China and South Korea, North Korean defectors also seek asylum in third countries, such as the United States and European countries. Uh, one such example is that New Malden in Southwest London emerges as the home to a large Korean community <clears throat> sorry, of 10,000 Korean residents and 700 of them being North Koreans. And consecutively, 19% of defectors, mostly the younger and better educated defectors, prefer the United States as their final destination for resettlement uh, because of the possibility of better educational opportunities and prospects. Uh, now, the third part of the presentation is uh, I was, I'll be looking at the various efforts made by the South Korean government and non-governmental organizations that seek to protect and produce asylum for defectors. Uh, first, by legal provisions in the North Korean Refugees Protection and Settlement Support Act 2019, Article 1 and Article 2 states that the South Korean government seeks to provide protection and support to help North Korean residents who desire to be protected from the Republic of Korea. This has to come willingly. One of the ways this support is provided is by a resettlement support facility called Hanawon, which means Institute for Oneness, and is funded by the Ministry of Unification, Thong Ilbu. Uh, now, Hanawons provide a 12-week course where the defectors are given basic knowledge of South Korean culture, and they are also uh, they are also educated on using life skills such as using an ATM taking the subway, mobile phone usage, etc. And they are also taught about the general principles of democracy, basic human rights, and how capitalism works. Apart from this course in Hanawon, the government also provides a basic fund of 8 million Korean won to a single person household. And the fund is increased if the defectors have disability or are, uh, or are senior citizens. Housing is arranged through rental apartments and a training allowance is provided to get employment opportunities. Other than that, livelihood benefits and healthcare benefits are also provided. After settling uh, in South Korea and graduating through the course from Hanawon, uh, if the North Korean defectors as new South Korean citizens, if they seek to further their education or search for jobs, quotas and scholarships are also made available in South Korean universities and special vocational courses are run, which can help them provide technical skills for the work workplace. Uh, the two NGOs that I've taken for my studies are Database Center for North Korean Human Rights, NKDP, and the North Korean Strategy Center, NKSP. The North Korean Human Rights Database Center dedicates their effort to provide support to North Koreans living in South Korea through resettlement support, psychological counseling, and data collection. And the North Korean Strategy Center is uh, surrounded more on educating North Koreans living under North Korean re regime. And they do this and they do this through by hiding USB drives and CDs that make their way across the border in the black market in North Korea. In this way, we can highlight the efforts of both the government and NGOs working in South Korea to help uh, to help integrate the North Korean defectors. Um, you can uh, see in this bar graph that uh, the efforts uh, efforts made by the rehabilitation and resettlement efforts, which are laid out by for peaceful integration, and we can see through the bar graph that the policies do seem to be working because from 2014 to 2019, the satisfaction level with life in South Korea of North Korean defectors has been increasing. Uh, and lastly. 
uh, the main goal of this paper is to rewrite integration efforts of North Korean defectors into the South Korean society by giving their struggles in assimilating a heavy part a heavy part in the politics of nation building. Mostly this is usually neglected while discussing uh, the politics and military effects of North and South Korean integration. Uh, defectors, yes. Uh, defectors also need to feel a sense of belonging in a new country for which an individual effort is also required. As the graph suggests, an above average response to unification is through peaceful coexistence and seeking unification through dialogue and negotiation. This stresses the importance of public participation and interaction, which will help bring the people of the two countries together. Even though South Korea celebrates events like uh, Unification Education Week, uh, people still need to move towards a situation of mutual recognition and coexistence. Uh, in a report by Yonsei Medical Journal, a study conducted showed that North Korean defectors go through post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, anxiety, and depression. The study also showed that North Korean defectors who live without family members develop psychological problems because they do not have a support system on which they can rely on. And this makes them more prone to isolation and loneliness. And even though many defectors choose South Korea as a location to defect, because uh, North and South have uh, have minjok, which means same roots, some North Koreans view uh, some South Koreans view North Koreans as foreigners and a safety threat. And we can see this happening to a lot of refugees all over the world. And defectors also do not come forward or even recognize discrimination in South Korea because they're past experiences are more traumatic to register such acts against human rights. Uh, therefore, these are some policy uh, solutions that I would like to suggest. And uh, first and foremost, racial sensitization needs to be carried out for social acceptance. And it, it can also help create a positive outlook for North Koreans for the South. Social culture diversity also needs to be adopted and ideological perspectives need to be reframed to help ensure a gradual and peaceful integrated Korean Peninsula. Uh, and I would like to conclude my presentation by a quote from the book, Dear Leader by Chang Jin Sung, which goes, we must place our faith in the people of North Korea, not in the system that imprisons them. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Terry, for that presentation. That was amazing um, and uh, lots to discuss later on, I'm sure. Uh, next up, we have, hopefully we have Professor Monica S. Chang uh, for her presentation about uh, North Korean uh, abductions. Uh, the, the title of my uh, presentation is North Korean abductions at South Korea. And actually, um, this is based on the words that I've seen published. Uh, this past fall from from AR, my friends do, and I, I came more so to promote and encourage more interest for the issue that has been neglected for so many years. And um, I will put all of you know, the numbers uh, in the content of why we should all be keen to this issue since it's already decades old. Uh, so next slide. I'm going to just show some pictures of those that have been adopted during the Korean War. And uh, you know, just to let us know that even though it's during the Korean War, which has been so many years ago, at the same time, these were significant figures that have been adopted during that time. So the next slide, I think. And here, you know, it's someone's father, someone's mother that uh, has been taken, daughter. Uh, and these are pictures for after the Korean War because there are two categories uh, Korean War of the Peace and after post Korean War of the Peace. So th these are pictures of post Korean War of the Peace where the uh, 1969 Korean Airlines were hijacked. And so far, most of them have been repatriated, but 11 still detained and imprisoned in uh, North Korea. Next slide. And this is actually uh, an abductee during that hijacking in 1969, 
where she comes back to meet her mother um, in a third uh, reunion meeting for separated families. Note that separated families are families divided during the Korean War. So they're officially separated sometimes by option where they chose to go to the North instead of staying in the South. But in this case, she's not a separated family member by the division of the war. She was um, abducted at the same time she participated here. So this is the picture where the mother meets after 31 years. Next picture, please. And then this is another picture that I want to share. A South Korean fisherman abducted in 1987 and he meets his mother here on the, uh, the, this is the second reunion meeting. So there are 21 uh, reunion meetings so far in South Korea with North Korea amongst the separated families. And accordingly, uh, it should be for those families that have been divided during the war. But uh, Kim Dae-chung administration decides to include this humanitarian approach for the abductees because North Korea has been denying these abductions, period. Therefore, there's no other solution to actually unite. Therefore, uh, Kim Dae-chung administration decides to do this. So this is the first year where the second reunion, first year where the abductee was included as the separate family. Next. And these are high school boys that were abducted uh, 1977 to 1978-ish. They were on vacation at the beach, and then they were all taken. And some actually, one returned for the family reunion meeting, and I will show you more about that later. So next slide. Okay. And this is actually, um, so the one of the high school boys was married to Megumi, another Japanese abductee, 1977. She's known to have died, but um, North Korea arranged this marriage and you know, her father passed away recently too, but this family has been longing and longing, but actually, next slide, North Korea has you know, put these two together, Kim Young-nam and Megumi, next slide. They actually have a daughter. And uh, you know the arrangement when uh, you know the granddaughter got to meet the grandparents, and Megumi no longer is alive, and you know Kim Jong Nam was able to participate in the separate families reunion. Therefore, he got to meet you know, his mother. His mother met you know Megumi's parents. So all this is kind of interrelated. At the same time, it's oftentimes neglected. So next one. Mm -hmm. And this is another case where Kosang, a high school teacher, geography teacher, was abducted in Norway. His wife, uh, newlywed, after one year, he left to you know, be in Norway for exchange program. And then finally, he gets abducted by uh, going into the wrong embassy. Uh, it was a North Korean embassy, <laughs> but you know they, he, uh, the cab driver took him to the wrong. And when he was taken in North Korea, they made him interview saying that he actually wanted to. So it's not by force, but um, the wife eventually committed suicide after longing for her husband. She also had a baby uh, together. So this, I kind of wanted to start with pictures because I wanted to make it come to the heart of the audience of how it would be if it's your personal family that is in this kind of situation where the long years of agony was continued. Uh, next slide. And Nakukta is the Korean term abducted to North Korea. It's defined as a South Korean citizen who has been abducted by North Korea during or after the Korean War against their will, detained and residing in the North. So far, the number of Korean war abductees are 96,013 by the Korean War of the Family Union. This is the nonprofit organization where the families are gathered together to long and try to have some kind of retreat and more information about their abducted family member. And but the government actually recognized only 4,777 as the official number because there are questions whether it was it by you know willingness or was it by force. You know, also the families must register that their family members were abducted. Uh, abductees after the Korean War, post-war Korean abductees, their number is only 516 still retained in North Korea, detained in North Korea, but the actual number is 3,835 where 3,310 were repatriated, nine escaped and returned. The nine escaped 
uh, returned uh, refugees are actually returned. They escaped more so through civil society. It wasn't really led by the government in the front line. Uh, so it's really important. How does the government react and how does the government approach this issue? Next. So, okay, so I use the Graham's um, Alice and Greek foreign policy analysis model, the rational actor model, the organization process model, the bureaucratic politics model, because I found the government's position in each of these models, but they're all interrelated. So, rational actor model is actually made by a choice of rationality. Kim Dae jung president, thought this as a rational decision to put it into a humanitarian approach where, okay, North Korea is constantly denying that they affected anyone. Therefore, the best way that we could approach this may be you know, put them into a, a position of separated families as special separated families. So that was one, one uh, model. The organizational process model is that based on that rationality, the Ministry of Unification has actually taken this as a protocol. So regardless of the situation between North and South Korea, the Ministry of uh, Unification and even from the North Korean part engage in these reunions because this is a very easy approach to interact. So right away, if they're still made, you know, it's a very easy approach for them to say, hey, it's Chuseok or hey, it's uh, you know, Spire, you know, New Year's, let's have this gathering so that uh, you know, it, it comes as a routine. So there's no government elites deciding whether it should happen or not. It's more like it's a routine that they try to process regularly. And here are bureaucratic politics model, demands for change or an alternative method to the existing humanitarian approach within the government. The humanitarian approach has not worked so well because obviously you can see that this is a criminal act. At the same time, to put it into a human uh, humanitarian issue would put the North Korean residents who have chosen to, they may not have chosen, but who are considered residents uh, during the Korean War with North Korea, the South Korean abductees categorized as residents. So the abductees should be treated as abductees. At the same time, you know, if we put them into a category of separated families, we kind of put that aside and you know just integrate them into the issue. Everyone clear on this part? <laughs> so you know, within the government body, there are a lot of uh, debates within the uh, committee that actually audits the Ministry of Unification every year. They talk about you know why should we continue with this humanitarian approach. And should we continue to integrate separated families and North Korean abduction issue? Next slide. So just being rational is kind of the subtitle uh, where the humanitarian approach chosen as the most rational method from the President Kim Dae Jun during the South North of June 15 joint declaration between Kim Dae Jun and Kim Jong Il. They decided that okay, we're going to have this humanitarian effort, and we're going to include the separated families, and even uh, along with addressing the unconverted long-term returning prisoners, because there were North Korean unconverted prisoners in South Korea still being uh, detained, and they were demanding their return to North Korea. And during this time, the president Kim Dae Jung decides to you know send them back to North Korea in the hopes of maybe bringing back some of the abductees, but that never happened. And he didn't really voice that out. So a lot of the family members of the abductees were very angry and disappointed with the situation. But anyway, in the case of the Kim dae -jung administration, very rational, very much uh, deciding that, okay, this may be the best option right now since we are constantly denies. And then uh, next slide. The standard protocol that I told you about the organizational process, where it's a routine, it doesn't really have to be debated much. It's just a protocol that they always continue. Some inter-Korean agreements to identify those people whose status become became unknown during the war and after the war, but ineffective from the very beginning. During the Kim Dae Jung administration, because of this implementation of you know these separate families and special separate families, and the fact that um, you know there are more dialogue reconciliation, there was some progress for making an agreement to look for and find and identify the living status of these abductees. 
but they don't identify them as abductees. They don't like the concept of abductees. They call them those people whose status became unknown during the war and after the war. And that's the part where the family was very uncomfortable with. At the same time, again, out of rationality, we don't want to offend or anger North Korea to stop the negotiation. So it was kind of a rationality by the government. At the same time, it hasn't worked at all. This agreement did not work because North Korea continues to deny and say, well, those people cannot be verified or those people have already passed away without even giving the date of death. So um, this is kind of the unfortunate situation. At the same time, there has been, like I told you earlier, 21 reunions of separate families held between 2000 to 2018. Right now, we don't have any uh, reunions in the process because of the stalemate, the deadlock between the two, North and South Korea. But um, it's been operated by the Korean Red Cross through the Ministry of Unification. And verification of 77 of the peace uh, Korean War abductees 13, post Korean War abductees 64 have been identified. Right? Are they living or are they dead? They passed away with 19 abductees participating in the reunion meeting. So, when you think about it, the rationality does seem to be you know, somewhat uh, effective. And the next mother and abductee son meets after 43 years. I just wanted to give you more image of the family because the reunion is so short, it's only for a few days. And you know, once we meet, you want to hold on to that meeting and you want to meet again and again, but that opportunity is not given. So this is the uh, mother and son you know, having to part, say goodbye. Next. And then, but the issue, you know, the problem with the separate families uh, integrating the, the, I mean, the abduction issue being integrated into the separate families issue is that South Korea basically, South and North, they send each other names of those separated families. And, and after they verify those names, they can kind of allow certain, especially the North Korea can permit certain members to go to the reunions. And the only number that they usually allow is 10 to 20 of these names on the list to be sent to North Korea as separate families. And then North Korea can decide whether, okay, this person is appropriate for the reunion. And whoever is sent to the reunion, it's usually one member or you know, maximum four-ish. So whenever they're sent, they're trained and educated to never talk about the abduction issue that they've been affected. So you know, that's the problem with this. And sometimes they don't even allow no participation of abductees in the reunions. Next. And then third one is the frustration without any remedy, the bureaucratic politics model where I told you how within the government body, there's a lot of debate, no progress in resolving the abduction issue. And many voice the humanitarian approach, is this really effective and is this necessary? And one of the committee members, he said, uh, the government is trying to resolve the issue in the larger framework of separated families, but this is actually a different matter in nature. Reuniting, reuniting separated family members at the reunion may be sufficient, but how can those that need to be repatriated be treated in the same category? So again, right? how can they be in the same category? Next slide. And then this is a, actually a daughter of one of the abductees. Fisherman Che Uyang, and he came into one of those meetings because every year there is a Foreign Affairs and Unification Committee that audits and monitors the role that the Reunification uh, Ministry of Unification conducts. And during this meeting, she was uh, invited to speak her mind, and she said that the integration of the abduction issue into the separate family issue is the same as killing the abductors twice. Explained that during the Cold War, the abductees and their families lived under the government's constant suspicion of being defectors. So, in the past, you know, because they were suspicious of being defectors and even spies, their family members are not allowed for certain, you know, jobs or certain titles, right? So, for certain opportunities. So, all the abductees' families went through that, and it was hard for them to speak out that their family members have been abducted even from the front. So here, 
argued that North Korean abductions are international terrorist acts where people were forcibly kidnapped, but the government is trying to solve the problem within the context of separated families without distinguishing between the cause and the facts. Okay, next slide. And then this is another member, Che Song Myung, is the head of the Abductive uh, Family Union, another organization fighting to bring back or get any kind of information about the abductees. But he also came into the meeting and said the integration itself is a failure. Say that although I disagreed with the integration of abductees in the category of separated families for 10 years, I have waited with a bit of hope that perhaps North Korea will respond better. But as expected, it has been nearly one abductee per reunion or North Korea's claim of being unable to verify life or death. And the one a lot of the union reunion has been trained not to speak of the abduction, but praise Kim Jong un as the provider of life. So he is always, you know, at the audit, like the meeting and trying to, you know, reiterate the frustration, the agony, that there's no progress with the humanitarian approach. During Kapuna administration, he went and spoke his mind. During Kim uh, Moon Jae administration, he went and spoke his mind, but he didn't get any response in terms of changing the policy. So next, conclusion. I cannot conclude that South Korean government has been negligent. I cannot say that you know, the South Korean government has been fully negligent because you know, the rationality of integrating the abduction issue into the separated family issue is already an action taken. And you know, so far, there have been 21 reunions with some abductions. Professor Jung, you have two minutes left. Okay. Two minutes left. Thank you. Thank you. So you know, this is kind of the uh, part where I can't say that. At the same time, is this still, you know, is it effective? The question of the rationality came from the fact that Kim Dae Jun, you know, he, President Kim Dae Jun, thought this is going to be a grand strategy which will eventually work. This is just the behind the scenes contact. We exchange more, we gather more, and eventually we'll resolve the issue. But that hasn't been the case. So you know, the families are losing hope. And all they wish not, because so many are aged, old in their years. So they think, okay, at least we see the death date, date of death, then at least we can commemorate their death. And then next, finally, next slide. Oh, yes. so Okay, here. So the conclusion that I made is likely it's going to come to the humanitarian approach. But, you know, what the government really needs to do is really have the decision maker to break away from the existing approach and, you know, really try to see what can we do to find alternatives. And the first investment is a division within the Ministry of Unification for the, uh, the uh, abductees and abduction issues separate from the division of separate families. Because currently the separated family division is conducting all the operation and management of question issues. So those are two different issues that should be handled. Okay, and then finally, you know, the government, then finally the abductee family members can say, okay, the government does care and will serve to meet the basic responsibility of the state to protect its own citizens. Okay, that's good. <laughs> thank you. Sorry Wonderful. No, thank you so much. That was uh, perfect timing, I think. Um, great, uh, and and lots of great insights there as well. So um, let me let me next introduce our, our final presenter, uh, who is who is Edith Yasmin Montez Inzin, who's presenting on their paper on changes and continuity in South Korea's foreign policy. Over to you. Thank you so much for this space. And I present the, um, some reflections about the change and continuities in the South Korean foreign policy about or related the inter-Korean relation after Donald Trump. So let me, okay. the objective of this presentation is to determine some change and continuities in the South Korean foreign policy, particularly in terms of the inter-Korean relations since the conclusion of the Moon Jae-in administration and the Donald Trump who added uh, disruptive elements in the inter-Korean relations. So to this end, the presentation is structured in three parts. First is a brief um, summarize of the summit, the inter-Korean summit. So for that, I call these parts from summit to, to crisis, North Korea again, to refer the 
um, the situation, uh, the, uh, the current situation. Then the second part is um, the focus of this presentation, that is the change or show the, the change and continuities um, in the June, uh, in the June Suk Yol administration. And then some reflection, because I am from Mexico, how um, this kind of process, the inter-Korean relation, uh, has impact in other scenarios, in particular in, this, in, the, in the Mexican scenario. So I refer briefly the relation between Mexico and North Korea. So about the first um, part of my presentation, how I say, I want to present um, a brief summarize of the summit and uh, the inter-Korean summit to explain how uh, arrived the crisis, the, the currently crisis um, produced uh, by the, 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 the North Korea. So uh, how you know, the, um, how refer um, the professor Monica, um, we remember this inter-Korean summit, the first and the second, because then uh, I think we, um, we have present uh, or more present the currently inter-Korean summits, but in the particular about this summit, the first and the second, I have to refer and the inter-Korean summits are meeting between the leaders of North and, North and South Korea. And today there have uh, been five inter-Korean summits, how I refer in this slide. The first inter-Korean summit was um, uh, between June 13 uh, to 15 uh, um, in the 2000 year. And the second inter-Korean summit is uh, between second and to four uh, October in 2007. And the uh, next inter-Korean summit was in the April 18, um, 2018, May 2018 and September 2018. Three of them, uh, these inter-Korean summits are in Pyongyang and other two in Panmunjom. The importance of these summits is, uh, is lies in the lack of formal communication between North and South Korea, which make it difficult to discuss political and economic issues. About the first inter-Korean summit, uh, how I refer, is in 2000, in 2000. <laughs> Uh, when representative of the two governments uh, met for the first time since the division of the Korean Peninsula. In this uh, case, the leaders uh, of the Kim Tae-jun, the president of South Korea, who arrived at Pyongyang uh, International Airport to meet uh, Kim Jong-il in this moment, a uh, supreme leader of North Korea. And uh, they petted, um, one thing I mentioned in the Mexican Academy who is focused in the uh, Korean studies is that the epithetic historic is always applied to the first inter-Korean summit because here in the social media and the, and this, um, the media in, here in Mexico um, in, in this scenario, when was the inter-Korean summit in 2018, many media uh, referred how historic, but I, I find that is not correct because the epithetic historic is only for the first inter-Korean summit. And uh, I noticed that the media and the academy, uh, the Mexican academy forget this first inter-Korean summit in 2000. So, um, the inter-Korean in, um, in this first inter-Korean summit uh, was, um, was uh, published, uh, the, um, published, I'm sorry, uh, a joint statement uh, in, in, in June, and uh, it has uh, 15 um, points, but I then refer, then, then I refer uh, how I classify this kind of uh, points. Okay, the second inter-Korean summit was in between uh, the president No Mu Hyun and who crossed, who crossed the Korean uh, delimitarized zone on October uh, second, on second October 
uh, in 2007 and traveled to Pyongyang for talks with Kim Jong-il. How I, I refer then was this, uh, this inter-Korean summit that maybe you, you know more about this, um, the, the uh, third inter-Korean summit in April 2018, the fourth inter-Korean summit in May 2018, and finally, um, the five inter-Korean summit in September uh, 2018. The, the most important or relevant characterize of this uh, inter-Korean summit uh, you notice it's in the same year. And I, um, I mentioned when, when I refer this, uh, this situation, the inter-Korean relation, is that the historical encounter in this contemporary uh, summit as the meeting uh, uh, between the North Korea and the United States. How you know, the first uh, meeting was in June 2018, then was a second uh, meeting in February 2019. And finally, this is a no formal uh, meeting, but was the, the last time when uh, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump uh, two met in June 2019. And in this occasion, if for, um, for that I use this photo, um, in this occasion was the, uh, not only Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump, if not, uh, but we can include or, or include a uh, two moon Jae. Um, it the after these meetings, uh, how you know, uh, there has uh, published some statements, and uh, when we review this this statement, we can uh, find three three dimensions of this approach. These dimensions are in the political sense. Uh, economic sense and social sense. In the case of the political sense, uh, the, the, the declarations of this uh, summit are focused on the question of re reunification, the end of the war, how, I, how we know uh, the, um, the, in the Korean Peninsula, there is a war. And in this, in this statement, um, uh, always mention the end of the war, but no, no ha doesn't happen it. Uh, resolve the nuclear issue of the peninsula, relation based on the mutual respect and trust, dialogues uh, between authorities and both, uh, of both Koreas, I'm so sorry, incorporation of, the, of new levels of dialogue, in, in, in particular the parliamentary level, and its military uh, tension. In the economic dimension, we find uh, economic cooperation projects, uh, development and mutual prosperity, investment and infrastructure, uh, joint maritime projects, is issues of passage, communications, and custom clearance, build shifting uh, complex, and the cooperation in the fleet and the files of agriculture, healthcare, and environmental protection. And finally, in the dimension, uh, the social dimension, we find uh, how you refer or the, the, the the presentation before uh, than me, uh, the, the meetings between separate families, the cooperation in the files of history, language, education, science and technology, culture and art, and sports, cooperation before, before natural disaster, and job delegation in sporting events, how uh, we notice in before the first inter um, the third inter-Korean summit, when, when the Pyongyang and the Seoul delegation uh, are together in the Winter Olympics. Uh, <clears throat> Allow me to mention this characterization, um, uh, the present, uh, the, the growing in the, uh, tensions on the Korean Peninsula. In this regard, I would like to uh, bring you up a colleague's interpretation of this cycle of return and tension on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Inter-Korean relations have present advance and setback, uh, which oscillates between conflict and cooperation, and which are determined by internal and external factors of this uh, relation. In this sense, we can speak of a crisis construction, particularly in the case of the North Korea, 
that have served to achieve, uh, to achieve certain national interests. According to Kan Bu, a doctoral candidate in the political science of, at Boston College, this artificial crisis have three, character, three characteristics. Credible threats, um, and I want to refer to the, the, the currently tensions, credible threats, threats in the short term or a key time, uh, and it's not easy to identify the next step of the threats. And we can say in general that the manifestation of this crisis is through military action, such as provocative military exercise, how I see in this day, and firing of artillery shields uh, towards South Korean territory. On the other hand, we can also talk about a traditional system of sanction against uh, North Korea, use military cooperation with allies in the region, uh, sanctions and no, prolif uh, no proliferation mechanism uh, such as a sport, a sport controls. About the point of the focus of my presentation is show some change and continuities in the June administration and Biden administration because um, the inter-Korean summit is uh, during the Moon Jae-in administration and uh, how would you say the Donald Trump administration. But first I want to refer uh, some scope and limits of the US and North Korea encounters because that is the historical meaning in this uh, current uh, moment. <laughs> and I want I identify this uh, situation. I read between the Korea and we, we can ask um, during these meetings or um, yes, during this meeting, what happened with the other international actors? And in this case, I, to re I refer, for example, what happened with the TikTok uh, party or the, the, um, the talks of the six party? How you know uh, these uh, meetings between China, uh, Russia, North Korea, South Korea, and the United States and Japan, but what happened with these other actors? And also during these uh, um, meetings or encounters between uh, United States and North Korea, we noticed an uh, improvement of the nuclear arsenal of North Korea. How, uh, how can prove this? The Council of Foreign, on Foreign Relations shows this, um, this evolution of the North Korean arsenal. And if you notice, during the Kim Jong-un, um, I mentioned like administration, we noticed this uh, increase of or, or improvement of uh, its arsenal. And related to the Biden administration, we noticed uh, this or we can characterize like a diplomacy and a strong uh, deterrence. First, identify, we identify that uh, the Biden administration is focused on the internal policy. Uh, in these days, we, uh, we know uh, the, the political situation in the United States, uh, election very controversial. And also we notice a pragmatic in the, in the discourse, a pragmatic and gradual approach about North Korea and in general in the foreign relation of the United States. Also, uh, Biden administration prior a uh, multilateral sol solution, in particular the Indo-Pacific strategy in this, in this case. But also we have to take in account uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic because the Biden administration expects that the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic affect North Korea and uh, it uh, accept the, 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 the aid of uh, United States and also some uh, criticize or researches of this situation uh, identify a lack of clarity and direction and creativity uh, of the Biden administration related to the North Korean issue. And about the uh, John Suk uh, Jol administration, we identify um, a policy uh, between the deterrence and defense uh, related to North Korea. 
uh, further alignment with the United States, in particular uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy, because uh, South Korea now is in, in the dilemma if um, completely alignment <laughs> to the United States or, um, or what happened with China. In the case of the China, indicate the further cooperation with China in a line of the mutual respect. And also uh, the Jun Sok Yeol administration uh, tried to improve uh, the relation with Japan, uh, like a trilateral alliance, uh, Japan, uh, United States, and uh, South Korea. Also promote a global cooperation network, and in this case, um, promote a diversification um, policy, but or, or in particular in the economic sense, to um, to containment uh, the, the 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 dependence of China, and also uh, we identify in these uh, months in the uh, June Sok Yeol foreign policy a uh, um, uh, an intention to define an international identity um, to promote um, a, a liberal democratic values. And finally, I, I said that how a Mexican research, I identify um, the intercorrent uh, process or, or, or this kind of problems or tension that is very far from, from here, from Mexico, how affect uh, these this scenarios or, or these domestic scenarios and I want to mention how this situation affects our relations uh, between Mexico and our Korea. Um, we have uh, an, um, an episode in this sense when, when in 2017 increased the tensions uh, with North Korea because, you know, in that... Uh, you have year, two minutes left, two minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, is enough? to finish my point <laughs> um, in this time in 2017 uh, you know that North Korea um, made uh, many uh, military exercise and in, in this time Mexico or in uh, it is a timeline in August 2017 Mike Pence uh, made a urgent call to the governments of Chile Brazil Mexico uh, and Peru to make the necessary to insulate Pyongyang. But the only government to do something was the Mexican government. And what uh, do? What did? <laughs> uh, in September 2017, the Secretary of Foreign Relations, that is the equivalent of the Minister of Foreign uh, uh, Affairs in Mexico, Luis Videgaray, declared uh, to the North Korean ambassador as persona non grata. And then, we have a change uh, uh, in um, change of president and arrive a um, uh, left uh, party in, in Mexico. And in, this, in December um, 2018, um, the Kim Jong Nam, president of the Presidium of the Supreme People's Assembly of North Korea, arrives to Mexico City to attend the inauguration of our president, that is the president of this uh, kind of party. And um, we notice that um, the, the relation uh, between Mexico and North Korea improved. Then in September uh, 2020, the Mexican president received the credential of the new uh, North Korean ambassador. But this is- That is uh, 20 minutes. If you could wrap, wrap up there, that would be great. Thank you. Just finish okay. your final points. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Okay, uh, I finished. So, but in 2000 to, um, 2021, uh, our uh, Secretary of Foreign Relations, the, the new of the new government, Marcelo Ebrard, revealed that the Mexican government is to working to reopen the, the diplomatic and commercial relations with North Korea, but the criticize of the, the Mexican Academy was that we never uh, break a relation with North Korea because uh, if we, if you uh, name a, a person like a persona non grata, doesn't mean that uh, the, the, the countries 
um, finish uh, the, uh, it, its relations. So this is a, a diplomatic imprecision. And um, what's very interesting that the Secretary of Foreign Relations uh, uh, did this declaration when we never uh, finished the relation with North Korea. But the interesting or the, the point of I want to mention this, this episode was to emphasize um, how this kind of process that uh, looks very far of us uh, have an impact in the domestic or the foreign policy like a country uh, how Mexico. So thank you so much and I expect your question. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation, really appreciate it. Um, I believe we have two discussants, myself and we also have uh, Professor Kyung Ho Song um, is scheduled to speak. I can't see Professor Song on the list of online participants, so I will hope that I see. Okay, we have in the room, brilliant. Uh, my understanding is that Professor Song has been asked to um, give some more detailed feedback and questions on uh, Professor Monica S. Chung and also Taru Aluwalia's uh, presentations. Um, and then after that, I will also uh, give my feedback on Edith's presentation um, and also a couple of questions for the other presenters. So I will hand over to Professor Song now. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding first presentation of Taru Aluwalia, um titled Inter-Korean Relation and the Elusive Situation of North Korean De facto in South Korea. I, I believe that this is very you know, important issue, um, not just focusing on the inter-Korean relation, you know, just the, the very existence of North Korean de facto and um, the treatment of them in South Korea uh, somehow reflect the reality of um, North and South Korean relations. Um, I can see, I, because uh, your presentation was so informative, so I can see uh, South Korean government and non-government non organizations um, effort to support North Korean defectors in, in South Korea. But um, one thing I'm clear during your presentation is that um, just my personal curiosity, do you, think this is uh, somewhat sufficient to help? Because um, in South Korea, the, about 10% of the cause of death of North Korean defectors in South Korea was suicide. So this is very, you know, um, what evidence that is saying we are not actually helping them to integrate or just survive in South Korean society. So, um, and another thing is that uh, when we talk about North Korean defectors, we always have a strong tendency to, to treat them as a you know, homogeneity agents. Uh, they're from very different uh, places and they have very different you know, social economic background. And um, of course, 60% of them are women and 60% of them are from uh, the northeastern uh, area of North Korea. But still, uh, we need to consider um, the complexity and diversity of North Korean defectors. And uh, when we talk about comparative politics in South Korea, we are always considering something like cross-sectional identity or something, but we never giving those kind of um, lands to North Korean defectors. So uh, I understand that uh, we, we, we can help them, we need to help them and we have to solve the problem of uh, that you know, North Korean defectors are facing in South Korea. But another thing is that we, we you know, not, just, not just helping them, but trying to understand them. And this, is, um, this requires uh, not just the problem of educating them or just you know, giving more money or housing or something. So of course, South Korean discrimination or discriminative uh, recognition of North Korean defectors is a very big issue. But before that, at least before that, uh, we have to you know, reconsider uh, their, their you know, identity. And uh, one minor thing I want to mention is that uh, um, I just, I just show that to us, um, most of South Korean or North Korean defectors 
one peaceful coexistence between North and South Korea. But with this kind of attitude or strategy uh, between two Koreas, uh, the value of North Korean defector will be lower because uh, when we are in very serial uh, conflict between South and North Korea in, in Cold War era, we treated North Korean defectors as a hero. So they escaped from you know, uh, vicious, evil government. So we have to you know, reward them or praise them as a hero. But now uh, we're, you know, uh, we have somewhat different uh, inter-Korean relations. So uh, we are not evaluate those kind of uh, their action of defecting from uh, North Korea. So, and to the second uh, presenter, uh, Monica Jones, a North Korean addiction of South Korea. Um, I think this is also a big issue like North Korean defectors. And um, as presenter mentioned, the strategy of Kim Dae-jung government, former president Kim Dae-jung government, uh, just you know, uh, include abductees in separate family as a problematic. But another thing is that, for, for an example, um, the fundamental you know uh, problem of for this uh, situation is almost impossibility of verification, right, I believe. Um, yes, uh, we can say that North Korean government is, is you know, not admitting that they abducted someone uh, during the war or after the war. We can criticize those, uh, uh, those kind of attitude, but uh, I think we need to reconsider the term of, of North Korean government's expression like unable to verify. So I think that there's some kind of half truth because this unable to verify, the expression like unable to verify means two things. One is that uh, they don't want to admit it. And second is that they really don't have any capability to verify. So, um, with this kind of uh, unwillingness and incapability, I think that uh, just you know uh, clarifying those people, the adoptees, and um, asking North Korean government to admit this kind of um, fall is cannot be a this strategy, because this is basically Japanese government's strategy for North Korea. Um, and um, if we take this same you know, strategy against North Korean government, uh, North Korean government probably don't want to admit it with the two reasons, so not to showing that they are not, they don't have any capability to verify this kind of issue. And um, you know, um, so uh, this is I had I had you know many things to talk make about this issue, but this is so so complicated. So, um, Professor Song, about seven yeah, minutes. So if so I can ask you to last, wrap up there. Yeah, yeah. My last comment is like investigation in South Korea itself uh, can be seen as an offensive. Uh, policy against North Korean government, as you know. So, um, even though to help uh, the family of affected, we have to do that. But is it is this only possible uh, way to do by the hand of government? Because non-governmental organizations can do the similar things, and you know we can have some like side way to solve the problem. So, I I'd like to ask your opinion about this issue. Thank you. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, well, I will keep my uh, comments brief then and uh, just focus very much on, on that final presentation on Edith's work. So uh, to kind of recap where we were with the last presentation. So this is one that really looks at South Korean foreign policy developments um, quite broadly to begin with, with an emphasis on the history of inter-Korean relations and also the contemporary impact of 
uh, these elections of both uh, President Biden and President Yoon, uh, respectively, in the US and South Korea. And also at the end, we have that rather interesting overview, don't we, of the recent developments uh, between Mexico and North Korea. So for me, the real kind of highlight of this presentation uh, is its focus on these relations between Mexico and North Korea at the end there. Um, typically, you know, when when analysts or, or what Jeff would call North Korea watchers um, look beyond Northeast Asia and, and the typical uh, uh, range of actors there, they, they typically look to Southeast Asian states, you know, in their expected roles, either as something like a, a sanctions enforcer or as a, a diplomatic mediator, uh, as we saw um, in Singapore and Vietnam with those summits. Um, so I think there's room here for a really good paper that maybe looks at Mexico as a test case of maybe like a, a Central or South American, you know, a, a country from that region and their relations with North Korea and what they kind of add or how they complicate our understandings of what's going on in the peninsula. Or, you know, alternatively, perhaps even a comparison of uh, Mexico's relationships with uh, South Korea and its relationships with North Korea uh, would be particularly interesting from my perspective. You know, Mexico and uh, South Korea, of course, both uh, frequently define themselves as, as middle powers. They're both part of MICTA um, as, a, as a minilateral grouping. So I guess the question from my perspective is, is, does this kind of middle power solidarity, when it exists, does it extend to this North Korean uh, issue? Um, so as I say, ultimately, I think there are, there are perhaps two different papers here um, that, that, that Edith kind of has um, as a as a starting point, one more kind of policy oriented uh, piece that gives your assessment and your viewpoint on these recent developments in in inter Korean and uh, US North Korea ties and the approaches to it very broadly, um, and another that's perhaps more academic though though it could also be uh, policy oriented in terms of an assessment of how Mexico navigates the issue of inter-Korean politics as, as perhaps as a, as a middle power. Um, so, so my questions for you, Edith, specifically, um, I've got three uh, noted down here. The first one being uh, under, under President Yoon, um, you talked about kind of in your title, continuity and change, but would you say that President Yoon is more defined in his approach by continuity or change in his approach to North Korea? I don't think you mentioned yet the, uh, what do they call it in English, the audacious, audacious initiative, his kind of uh, key North Korean uh, policy, which has kind of uh, faded into obscurity as almost as soon as it's been announced, right? Um, but I wonder how you would define him, you know, is it be more continuity or more change? Uh, secondly, you know, uh, you talked about these cycles of crisis and then, uh, you know, getting closer and then back to crisis again. And in my view, part of the problem there is that these, uh, these the, the countries that are most important in managing peninsular security, the US, China, South Korea, Japan, uh, North Korea, a lot of them are kind of content with the status quo, in my view. So I guess the question is, in your opinion, who of these main actors in the region is most likely to kind of break the cycle? Who's the one who's going to be most dissatisfied with the status quo that is going to stop us kind of repeating these cycles of, of tension and then kind of uh, coming together and detente, right? Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll wrap up here. So finally, you know, the, the, the relations again between Mexico and South Korea, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how this might impact uh, the relations between Mexico and North Korea. Um, I'm not sure what the view is taken of uh, MICTA in Mexico. I know in Australia, um, people are very kind of, um, uh, very willing to write it off, I think, but I'm, I'm not sure whether that viewpoint extends to other countries in that minilateral grouping. So I will finish my remarks there. And then if we do have time at the end, I do have questions for the other panelists. Um, but I would first like to make sure that everybody has a chance to respond. So I guess we will um, say thank you very much to Professor Song, of course, for his uh, excellent uh, comments and questions. And we'll go back to Taru for, for your response, please. Uh, yes. So uh, thank you so much, Professor, for your comments. The first question that I heard was, do you think the government and non-government uh, efforts would be enough? 
Uh, I don't think it would be enough. And we can see that even though they provide monetary efforts on ground reality of the defectors can be very different. So uh, in my, that's why there's a need to rewrite integration efforts from a humanitarian lens. That even though you give uh, persuades, you give grants, you give support facilities, there should also be a way to tackle psychosocial problems. Like there should be a mental health facilities, there should be a integration efforts in which the entire society can participate, not only the government and the defectors. And, uh, and the second question was, uh, you mentioned that considering the diversity of North Korean defectors, is it so easy to talk about integration? So uh, even though North Korea and South Korea share a similar features in terms of uh, his historical, ethnic, and linguistic backgrounds. Uh, there are also like many differences between both. Like for the one thing that I can think right now is that a lot of Korean loan words, for example, McDonald's, Ice Americano, and all are absent from the North Korean dialect. So in that way, they are very different. Uh, but from a third person perspective, I didn't take this limitation in my study. And it's actually a very useful suggestion, which I can incorporate it in my further studies, because as a foreigner, I may not know the ground reality of how different North Koreans and South Koreans really are. So I think I should learn, I should study more in this. And thank you so much for your suggestions. Yes. Yeah. So for me, um, I think the South Korean government can take promise for the families that are here. I mean, it's not it's limited on what they can do for the families because North Korea has so much control over, and it's very hard to um, negotiate or try to convince North Korea to take further action. So for me, it's the South Koreans' duty to take more proactive roles for the uh, families at least. In this sense, because there's different sets of uh preparation, like how they support the uh, these families and for the civil society, their roles are of course greater in action, and but they still need more support from the government in order to take certain actions. So even the uh, ones that I have really escaped the line, it's mostly from the society, civil society action that actually took place to bring them here. So, you know, I have, um, I try to understand from the South Korean perspective, South Korean government's perspective, but um, just for my personal uh, relations for the uh, families, I think, you know, because, you know, it just for all of us being humans, I think families are such a core value. Therefore, I, I believe government has so much responsibility for that. That's my answer. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. And uh, finally, we'll go back to Edith for your response. Just one or two minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you uh, so much for the reflection. In fact, I think also there are so, so, uh, two papers. <laughs> one is about this uh, cycle that I identified, and not only me, and also with other colleagues from Mexico, and I identified also in the international literature, this this kind of um, the characterization of the of the um, inter-Korean relations and the impact in, or, or or the intervention of the other powers, how you mentioned uh, United States, China, uh, Japan, Russia, um, but in fact is is one paper and then other paper that just I start in this in this year is the um, review of the um, status of the relation between Mexico and North Korea, because in fact, I study more the relation between Mexico and South Korea, because this year we, uh, we celebrate 60 years of relation between Mexico and South Korea. So I, I study a lot this, this relation, but in the case of the uh, North Korea and Mexico, it's very interesting because, um, uh, nobody knows this kind of relation. Mm, and always we assume that uh, North Korea doesn't have relation with other countries or, or only have relation with uh, uh, idol, um, the same ideological uh, countries like China or, or maybe Cuba or, or Russia, but uh, never uh, have in mind 
uh, this kind of relation with, with a country like Mexico, but we have this kind of relation. And it is very interesting. Notice this kind of uh, situation, like the, 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 the situation of the, um, the announcement of the, uh, uh, the North Korean ambassador, like persona non grata by the, govern the Mexican government, but it, 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 it's produced about these tensions and the role of the United States in Mexico in the Mexican uh, foreign policy, because you know, uh, Mexico has um, a great dependence of the United States. So for this reason, and in this year, I, 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 I forget to mention, in 2017, we are renegotiating uh, the, the, the NAFTA in that moment, now TMEC. So for that reason, Mexico take this, this decision, but was very criticized because we noticed uh, Mexico like a weak uh, country in the international system. But about your question, I think it's very complex. <laughs> uh, the first question is, is, is very hard, oh, oh, the, all the questions uh, is very hard because um, just I, I am working in identify this kind of change of opportunities because if you notice um, tomorrow I have to present one paper related uh, to this uh, change of opportunities in the in the South Korean foreign, uh, foreign policy because I noticed in the general um, aid axis uh, are, are continuities the same points that uh, the, 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 the South Korean foreign policy is the same but in the discourse, maybe in the discourse, is when we notice this kind of, ch of change. For example, uh, the Moon Jae-in uh, uh, or, or, or tried to uh, use the tension with Japan, in particular uh, the colonization of Japan to, to the Korean Peninsula, um, maybe with political ends. But now the Jun Sok Jo uh, administration in the discourse mentioned uh, to be near uh, Japan in, in, in particular in the Indo-Pacific strategy in this kind of trilateral relation. And, uh, but I think we have to take um, care with this, uh, this discourse. Oh, because I don't know if there's any questions in the room and if anybody online, including the presenters would like to ask a, a question. Um, you're more than welcome. I had a comment and question for the last two presenters. Uh, I was very interested in Mexico because I do research with faith-based workers and because U.S. citizens cannot travel to North Korea. So many U.S. Christians are funding and training people from Mexico and Brazil to go to North Korea instead, right? Be because, you know, and, you know, because Mexico is right next to the United States, they can easily go to California Training, training California, and then once they receive the training, they'll be sent to North Korea. And so uh, right now they're being trained and funded. And as soon as the pandemic border controls go down, they're hoping to send you know like hundreds of Mexicans, Brazilians, and people from other countries. And so uh, I thought that was an interesting connection, right? And then for what Monica said, uh, I'm not. I'm trying to understand why it's rationality. Oh, why it's rationality. Yeah, because it seems like none of us work. <laughs> it seems like, you know, like insanity, right? And, and so it seems like it's, it seems only irrational if, if, your end, if your end goal is like symbolic unity, okay? Like if you want like, you know, like separated families getting together or the, you know, the Olympic flag, okay? If that is your angle to symbolic unity, then it sounds rational because you're basically basically suppressing any divisions, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but then if your angle is to actually improve the lives of those affected, then it seems like what Japan is doing is more productive, which is that you can actually you know send money to because you know basically like hundred thousand North Koreans are kind of like soft abducted, mm -hmm. you know, they were basically deceived into coming to North Korea. But at least for several decades, they were, you know, they received money and letters from their families in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that, isn't that something that we can do? Yeah. That at least we can send money to those families in North Korea. And North Korean government loves that, yeah. you know. 
So, so both ways. And my rationality here is not my rationality, it's the government's rationality. Right. So I was wondering like, what's their so how do they think this government's rationality is by the fact that uh you know, first of all, ministry of denial and any kind of action taken is impossible. So for the government to rationalize how to approach North Korea was the best decision. And until this day, Moon Jae-in thinks that, you know, engaging them and trying to put aside the abduction case in the front line to provoke or to kind of, you know, make it sensitive mm -hmm. is the wrong choice. So for the government side, it's like rational to try to engage North Korea in a soft approach. And humanitarian approach has been a soft approach for the in the government position. So that's why, based on the analysis, mm -hmm. it's rational for the government. But of course, it's not rational for the scholar who's analyzing it. Uh, is there a government policy so families can send money to abduct them? There's no policy for that? There's no policy. It is impossible, I think. Yeah, it's like, like the sanctions. International sanctions, which are not directly sent money to uh, North Korea. There's no way to do it. Sure. I think um, civil society, the government, I don't know if it's doing that kind of policy approach. Japan can do it through the Chochomia. Right, Chochomia, yeah. exactly. But we're not, as you know, South Korea Security Act does not allow to contact with them and make some visits with them. So uh, we don't have any official channel to do so. Right, exactly. That's, that's the whole same thing that maybe that's something that we can tackle. Mm -hmm. You know, we can. Wow. I did just want to give um, Edith just 30 seconds, literally 30 seconds, if you had anything that you wanted to uh, respond to the, the question or comment there. Sorry. Um, um, yes, in fact, it's very interesting, the, the links. Um, also, for example, one uh, line of studies here in Mexico is the uh, Korean diaspora, um, because we um, identified that is very interesting the uh, migrant um, uh, movements uh, in, and I think it's very interesting the the geopolitical uh, issues or yes um, for, for um, how you mentioned Mexico is a neighbor of the uh, United States and this determine uh, many uh, futures of our uh, foreign policy Okay. and uh, the flood of this uh, this uh, migrant movement. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if we're maybe going to have to wrap up there. I don't know whether this uh, online webinar kind of automatically cuts out um, at 45 minutes past. I very much hope it doesn't. Um, but if it does, then uh, forgive me. Um, I'd just like to thank all our presenters again. And uh, uh, I'd like to invite everybody to give them a round of applause, either in the room or kind of uh, uh, remotely online. Um, thanks everyone again for coming to this event and uh, yeah, really appreciate it and I hope to see you again soon. Take care.